So back to when you changed up the um, the order in which you guys raced in in the relay it, in the relay race. <laughs> um, how how close to the actual race did you change the order? Great question. That's a great question, James. So for so the direct answer is the night before, Ooh. but yeah, but. I don't want you to think that actually it just came out of the blue. So I got into the British team in 1983. And there's a guy there called David Jenkins, who was the best athlete, uh, quarter mile in the British team then. And, you know, throughout the 80s, the early mid 80s, with being sort of scenario planning and thinking of different ways of running the relay. And, and so, so the idea had been floating around since the early 80s. But it was only the night before that Roger Black and I, who were sharing a room together in, our, in, in, in the uh, World Championship Village, woke up to the idea, this is it. This is the time. And the reason it was the time was because as we were talking and, and, and reviewing history, we realised for the last 15, 20 years, Americans had been unassailable, and there's a book by a woman called Margaret Heffernan, which is called Willful Blindness, and the world had been willfully blind to the reality that the way that the relay running had been structured was was to the benefit of the USA and to the detriment to the, to the rest of the world, because traditionally, best men last, second best first, and the other bits in the middle. And what you we saw is as you looked at the relay running, the Americans would open a gap of six or seven meters against the rest of the world, Second leg, two or three more. Third leg, 15 metres clear. And it didn't matter how good you were. You couldn't beat the mighty Mark Johnson with a 15 metre deficit. And so it was the night before that Roger and I ecstatically come up with the idea. And in the morning, I spoke to John and Derek. And you know when you've got a good thing. Because as we spoke to John and Derek, they were excited, enthusiastic. Yes, and, yes, and, yes, and, yes, and. And we had a phenomenal discussion. And it's great when you have a discussion and people are saying yes, and, rather than no, but. Mm. That's um. See, see, for me, I was kind of hoping you were going to say, say that because if you were, if you would have said, "Oh, we we spent fifteen years planning this master move," I would have been like, no. but again, for me, it kind of plays into what again what you were saying before. Having that vision, that collective vision to to win that race, to get that goal, to be the best in the world, allowed you to change your tactics on the fly, and it's something that companies don't do. Yeah. They they don't necessarily they don't have everybody understand that big picture and then empower them to change the way that they do things on i say on the fly but you know what i mean when i no, say that. definitely know what you mean james and it's, it's a case of like imagine if like an employee understood something and said oh you know what this isn't the way we should be doing it anymore there is a better way to do this but then to be told yeah but they're our processes that's our strategy that's what we yeah. do if, if yeah, the person you're talking to understood that bigger picture, like you were saying, they'd they'd buy into it, and they they would be saying yes and rather than no. But and I think that's again a really wicked way to to interpret things. Are people saying yes and? Are you a yes and sort of person, or are you a no but sort of person? And we all know no but sorts of people. <laughs> definitely. 